Please discuss uh, the impacts of animal products on the environment. Today, a shocking 26,000 species are currently threatened with extinction, and agriculture is a primary cause of that. Animal products use over 80% of the world's farmland, contribute 60% of food's greenhouse gas emissions, and 60% of our nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, as well as using a third of the world's water. Despite that, they provide just 37% of our protein and 18% of our calories. Please tell us about the trends in the meat and dairy industry. The forecast for 2050 is that we'll be consuming 1.3 trillion litres of milk and 500 billion kilograms of meat. That's a 60% increase on today, and that's going to come with tremendous environmental costs. Can you talk about the findings on cheese in your study? So out of all the different proteins we looked at, cheese ranked third in the amount of land that's used to create it and the amount of emissions that are created. It ranks higher than pork and poultry. Please tell us what you discovered about aquaculture. Yeah, so a, so a surprise from our study was that farmed fish can create more methane and more greenhouse gas emissions than beef. And that's largely driven by unconsumed feed and excreta going to the bottom of ponds where there's basically no oxygen and bacteria converting that into methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. Can you discuss the effects of grass-fed beef on the environment? So we looked at the differences between grass-fed beef and feedlot-fed beef, and we didn't find any clear distinctions in terms of environmental impact. What we did find was that the lowest impact beef is still using 36 times more land and creating six times more emissions than beans and peas for the same amount of protein. Converting grass into protein is like converting coal into energy. It comes with an immense cost in terms of emissions. Please talk about why the same category of products have such different impacts on greenhouse gas emissions. So differences in the environmental impact within the same product are driven by where it's produced and how it's produced. For example, beef cattle grazed on degraded and deforested pasture can use 50 times more land and create 12 times more emissions than dairy beef. So that 50 times is a 4,900% difference in land use. And today we don't know this when we're standing in the shops. Two products that look exactly the same can have dramatically different impacts on the planet. How can producers farm more sustainably? So there are about 500 million farms in the world and our evidence showed that all of those farmers need slightly different ways to reduce their environmental impacts. For one farm, it might be changing your cropping practices. For another, it might be changing fertilization practices. And one way that farmers could understand these, their own impacts and how to best reduce them could be through using digital tools that allow them to quantify these impacts and then reduce them. Are there benefits for farmers to move from livestock production to producing plant proteins? It's not always possible for farmers who are producing animal products to switch to producing plant-based proteins because a lot of land of the pasture globally, about two thirds isn't suitable for crop production. The remaining amount of pasture, other, the other third is suitable for some form of crop production. So for many farmers, it's not actually going to be possible to switch what they produce. Um, but equally for many, that is a possibility. And largely that's got to come from changes in demand from consumers. What can governments do to help farmers and businesses towards sustainable practices? I think for some farmers, there is the potential to change what they produce and we need market opportunities, more demand for sustainable, low impact and plant-based foods to create those opportunities for producers. Uh, equally, for many producers whose land isn't suitable, there isn't an opportunity and that's an important consideration, something we need to think about, something our policymakers need to think about carefully. Firstly, governments and policymakers need to take these issues 
need to take environmental issues far more seriously than they do today. Specifically, some things that they could do is one, require mandatory environmental labels on food. That would, that would provide consumers with information they don't have today. It would encourage producers to compete, not just on price and quality, but also on environmental issues. It would also create information in the whole food supply chain for different policies, such as taxes on, on unsustainable production and subsidies for sustainable production. So policymakers in general have got to take environmental issues far more seriously than they do today and put them much higher up the policy agenda. One specific thing that came out of our study that we think policymakers should be doing is mandatory environmental labelling on food. What that would do is provide consumers with information on what on environmental information on what they're actually consuming and encourage more people to think about the environmental impacts of their choices every time they're in the shops. Secondly, it would encourage producers to compete not just on price and quality, but also on environmental issues. Thirdly, it would mean that policymakers can do things like link subsidies and taxes to sustainability, rather than just how much it's produced or how much land is used. So globally, about half a trillion dollars a year are spent on subsidies for agriculture. And how much goes into each product varies by country. But one example, and particularly striking example in America, is that about 73% of a farmer's revenue is subsidies. 73% of a milk farmer's subsidy is revenues. So you imagine changing that subsidy and also including the environmental costs of milk production in the price of milk, and suddenly milk is no longer competitive with oat milk, soy milk, almond milk, and it's actually extremely, you know, the cost, the cost difference would change significantly. In your opinion, what is the best way that we can reduce our environmental impact on the planet? So for the typical global consumer, avoiding meat and dairy is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on Earth. Global adoption of plant-based diets would reduce the amount of land needed to produce our food by 3.1 billion hectares. That's an area the size of the entire African continent. That land could store carbon. If you add that to the differences in emissions between animal products and plant-based products, that's a 23% reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions. Put differently, that's the emissions of the United States and European Union combined. Plant-based diets would cut our nitrogen and phosphorus pollution by 50%, cut our water use by a quarter. All of this comes together and you see a planet that would look completely different from space. It'd be more vegetated. Climate change would be a lot more under control and our water resources would be far less depleted. What are the greenhouse gas emissions of meat and dairy production? So we looked at a range of different protein-rich products and different milks. And what we found is that the lowest impact animal products still create, typically use more land and create more emissions than plant-based products. The lowest impact milk is still creating two times the emissions of soy milk and using two times the amount of land. So even if you go into the shops and try and purchase sustainable meat and dairy, it's still going to be better to change what you consume and purchase plant-based products from an environmental perspective. How sustainable is eating meat and dairy for the environment? So from a planetary perspective, current levels of meat and dairy consumption are unsustainable. If you look at future demand, that's only going to get worse. And there are five reasons for the differences between animal products and plant-based proteins. One of them is that feed, is that feed conversion ratios, i.e. the amount of protein you need to provide an animal to create get one kilogram of protein back, are typically over two, over three, possibly as high as six. So you're producing a lot more feed to get the same amount of food. Secondly, all of that extra feed production requires a lot more land. So you're driving deep, more deforestation um, and preventing all that land from regrowing as trees and storing carbon. 
Thirdly, animals create their own emissions, whether it's from enteric fermentation, i.e. the production of methane by cows and other ruminants, or whether it's from their manure. Fourthly, emissions from animal product processing from things like slaughterhouse effluent tend to be higher than processing plant-based products. Fifthly, wastage of fresh animal products is higher than most plant-based proteins. So you've got all these different reasons that come together to create these much higher impacts. What is the main cause of biodiversity loss? So today, a shocking 26,000 species are currently threatened with extinction. And the most important driver of that is our use of land for agriculture. Globally, about 80% of the world's farmland is used for producing animal products. Animal products create about 60% of agriculture's greenhouse gas emissions, drive about 60% of our nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, and about a third of our water use. Despite that, they provide just 37% of our protein and 18% of our calories. Tell us about the data you used for your 2018 environmental impact report. So our data is based on 750 published studies and those studies have gone to countries around the world and assessed the environmental impacts of 38,000 farms and 1,600 food processors, packaging types and retailers. And this assessment covers the whole food supply chain from the clearance and deforestation of land for agriculture right through to retail. And it does all of this for five important environmental indicators. The amount of land used to produce the food, the greenhouse gas emissions created during its production, the water use, and two measures of the degradation of terrestrial land and water ecosystems, acidification and eutrophication. Does eating organic or local meat and dairy stop our environmental degradation and biodiversity loss? So in our data, we didn't find big differences between organic and conventional across multiple indicators. Uh, we also didn't find that transport was a very significant contributor to meats and dairies emissions, typically about two to five percent. What we did find is that no matter how you produce animal products, even the lowest impact forms of production still create higher emissions and use more land than typical vegetable proteins. So that's saying something really important. That's saying that even if you go into the shops and try and purchase sustainable meat or dairy, it's always going to be better to purchase vegetable proteins instead. What are the greenhouse gas emissions emitted by beef versus tofu? So to produce 100 grams of protein from beef typically creates between 10 and 105 kilograms of greenhouse gases. For tofu, to produce the same amount of protein creates just two kilograms of greenhouse gases. So agriculture has transformed the planet like nothing else. To produce milk, we farm an area about the size of Brazil. To produce beef, we farm an area about the size of Canada, the United States, the whole of Central America, Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador combined. To produce eggs, we farm an area the size of Sweden. To produce aquaculture feed, an area about the size of the UK. In total, animal products use 3.4 billion hectares of farmland. A plant-based diet would reduce the amount of land required to produce our food by 3.1 billion hectares. That's an area the size of the entire African continent. That includes about a 20% reduction in the amount of arable, i.e. prime cropland we require. So the current forecasts are that by 2050, we're going to be consuming 1.3 trillion litres of milk and 500 billion kilograms of meat. That's a 60% increase on today, and that's going to come with tremendous environmental consequences. So the only way to tackle the magnitude of this problem is if producers, consumers and policymakers take this issue far more seriously than they are today.